Best ever listeners, how you doing? Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any fluff. And with us today, the founder of Bigger Pockets. How you doing, Josh Dorkin? What's going on, man? You're a crazy man. I don't know how you do it every day. I, I, I am a crazy man. That is for sure. And you know, that is really interesting because I... I have video proof of you being a crazy man. I was on your Twitter, Twitter handle. I was looking at different posts or tweets you've made. And I have a question for you. You ready for this? <laughs> um, you're scaring me now. <laughs> I, hey, you tweeted it, baby. All right, what, what's up? What tastes better, a grasshopper, a mealworm, or a cricket? Oh, I, you know, I stuffed them all in my mouth at once. So <laughs> I couldn't tell you like, so, so what he's talking about, I went to the butterfly museum here in, in Denver. It's between Denver and Boulder. And, um, they, they basically have this thing where like, Hey, try out insects. You know, it's the super high in protein content and, and it's kind of, you know, the, the, what is it? The carbon impact of, of eating these insects is far lower than if you're eating comparable um, mammals, right? And, and so it's like, I'm with my kids. I got to be brave. I got to show them, you know, that I can do this super dad, right? And they have these three things that you could eat. And I'm like, all right, you know what? I'll do it. The problem is this. <laughs> they went and they seasoned Oh. all of these things so they it was like they put some powder on each of them each with its own flavoring all of the flavors of the powder were horrible <laughs> so if you were just eating eating these insects it would have just been crunchy and fine but like the powder was disgusting now have you isolated that where you do know the powder was actually the part that was horrible and not the actual insect insect itself the insect was fine yeah i had no problem eating the insect it was the powder was just kind of gross June seventeenth, two thousand seventeen. Josh, Josh's Twitter handle. Go look at that, and you shall see the video. He, you don't flinch. It's very impressive. You don't flinch. You just eat it. And you're like, mm, okay, next. I, what, what else you got? Got this. Got this. <laughs> well, we're what we're doing today is we're gonna learn more about you and perhaps some things that um, some best ever listeners who. I'd say 99.9% are all members of bigger pockets and that 0.01% shame on you. Go join. Um, we're going to learn more about you and, um, bigger pockets and your, your road to, uh, where you're at now and where bigger pockets is, uh, best ever listeners, slightly different format for this interview. We're going to do more of a long form and we're going to separate it out into two episodes. So this will be part one and then we'll just roll into part two. So here's what I'd like to start with. Um, I asked prior to our conversation, I asked some best ever listeners what questions they would have for you. Okay. And I, I think you're going to enjoy how we start out uh, because based on my conversations with you in person and just what I've read about you and interacted with you on Bigger Pockets. You take pride in helping people, helping bigger pockets members, and how it's a community and we're all in this together. So here's the question. This is from Kendra B. And she asks, Is there one person that sticks out in your memory as having been helped by bigger pockets and all the work that you all have done? The one person that sticks out. Um, the, the instant answer to that is Brandon Turner. The instant answer is Brandon Turner. Um, those of you who are unfamiliar, Brandon Turner is co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. He he works for us. Um, and uh, initially, when I came to know Brandon years and years ago, um, he was just a he was a user on our platform. He was um, trying to find financial freedom or whatever it is that he was trying to find, um, and used the Bigger Pockets platform to get there. And the he was, I think, the pure representation of who we were and what, what we strive for. You know, he was this guy living in the Pacific Northwest who had, um, you know, been kind of floundering around in his life. Uh, I think that might be an unfair <laughs> um, uh, characterization of Brandon, but <laughs> regardless, he was looking for, you know, Brandon, so he was looking yeah. for... Um, you know, he was trying to figure it out like the rest mm -hmm. of us. And, yep. and he came across bigger pockets and, and the idea of real estate. And 
use bigger pockets to help him build this passive portfolio of real estate and and of course living in the in the area that he lived in he was at a point where he no longer needed a job he had mm-hmm. he had created that freedom for himself um he was writing for bigger pockets and you know at that time i was in need of help i needed to hire somebody to come and join me as my first employee and you know we got to know each other and and, and i brought him on but yeah Br- brandon is is probably I think Brandon really just is that rep- pure representation of, of who we are. But um, man, there's countless stories. I mean, not not a not a day goes by where we don't hear from somebody who's like, "You guys are, you know, trans transforming my life. You guys are helping me out. You guys have, you know, helped me quit my job or help me retire or help me, you know, build income for my family or what, whatever it is." And and that's why we do it. I mean, we're here to help people succeed. Mm-hmm. You've got uh, what? How how many members are on the site now? Like seven hundred and twenty-five thousand. I think it's like eight thirty. Eight thirty. It depends on yeah. It depends on what day, right? Like every day, it gets more and more. Yeah. Eight hundred and thirty. Eight hundred and thirty thousand members. Uh, I'm sure that with the positive positive feedback, you get some gripes. And sure. how do you determine? what to listen to and what to filter out as just that's just how things are when you get to a certain point and you reach a critical critical number of people you're just going to get gripes uh the, the people gripes when i had like three people okay <laughs> <laughs> people always want to complain about something i mean i you know it that's really a good question how do i would say staying true to yourself knowing who you are and knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it um, and, and making sure everyone on your team is aware of that. So here's, and, and, you know, from time to time situations will arise where somebody has a gripe and you're like, Oh, well, you know, we never actually thought about this. Let's think about it. Um, Is this something we want to be reactive to, or is this something we want to deal with? Do we want to change how we do certain things, change policies, whatever it is, or is it, you know, is this a one-off situation it's hard, man. I mean, I think the same goes with, with anything in business, you know, whether it's uh, somebody flipping a house or, or buying rental property or, you know, running a laundromat. I mean, there's, there's always gripes that come at you. And, and I think the way to best deal with it is, is really know who you are, um, really have your values kind of uh, spun out and um, make sure that you're, you're, staying true to your yourself and and what you stand for and and ultimately your customers right i mean mm-hmm. no matter what we can't we cannot please everybody impossible like mm-hmm. whether it's me or amazon or tesla or any other brand apple right i mean the big guys i i'm not amongst those big guys but um <laughs> but um it, there's no way you're going to please everybody so you know i think coming to acceptance on that and understanding that you can't, but striving to have a customer forward looking business uh, like Zappos, you know, Tony Shea, they, they don't think of themselves as a shoe business. They think of themselves as a customer service business. And mm-hmm. I think we, we, we're not as outwardly stating of that, but, but I do believe that is core to who we are is we're here to help people be successful. We want to take care of people. We want to do right by people. And um, that's who we are. How do you communicate that amongst the team so that that is present with them on a daily basis as they're interacting with bigger pockets members and building bigger pockets? I don't need to because everybody who communicates with our users knows that um, if they don't and somebody interacts with somebody <laughs> in a way that doesn't feel like, you know, right let us know. I mean, you know, but ultimately that's part of kind of our training. That's part of, you know, how we, how we do things is making sure that those folks that interact and communicate, they know it. I mean, we're here, we're here for you guys. We're here for our, our listeners and our users. And, and our job is to do our best to play a unbiased intermediary and a platform where people could come together, where people can share information and where, where folks can help each other. I mean, at the end of the day, I see us as this 
democratization platform. Yep. That's a hard word. To that's say. a tough one. Yeah. I never, I never get it right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of who, who we are. So, um, yeah, I think that probably yeah. helps. And is there a, has there been a gripe that ha- that you can think of that has changed a policy or you all have changed maybe a product or a feature on the site as a result of it? Uh, man, I mean, we, we get gripes every day and, and then our team takes them, looks at them, evaluates them, decides if something needs to be altered, tweaked, and modified, and they, they do it. I, I don't even know about all the... Mm-hmm. The, the tweaks and changes that, that happen. I mean, we, we give, um, we empower the folks within the team to, to be able to do that. And, and um, I, man, I, any, anytime we do anything, we, we, we piss people off. I mean, it's, you know, remember when Facebook did that last redesign? No, we all forget it. But like when it happened, everyone was like, ah, screw Facebook. I'm done. I'm never going to go back again. Right. This is it. Yeah. We all went back. I mean, it's, you're used to something, right? You get used to how things are done and, and when something changes, you're going to, you know, it's, it's off-putting um, until you either decide that you like it or you really don't like it. And at that point, we can then look at it and say, oh, well, is this something that is affecting more than just one person? And, and we test stuff and we, mm-hmm. we create test groups and, every, every, you know, we don't ever just say, oh, hey, we're going to make a change because this is what we think and we put it out there. You know, we, we talk to users. We have years and years and years of collective wisdom plus we talk to our users on a daily basis then uh you know and anytime we make you know radical changes we, we always bring folks in and and kind of work through uh to make sure that we're doing it in the best way possible but is there any one thing i don't know i mean let's see we we came up with a product that i thought was going to be amazing unbelievable which was a live chat like we had created a live chat so users can chat with each other kind of like a Facebook chat or or something like that um, so if you're logged in you go to XYZ's profile it'll tell you if they're online and then you can just start chatting with them and um, we launched it I was pumped this was what two years ago and it was an abject failure like <laughs> a complete and utter failure people didn't like it didn't use it um, it might have been execution it could have been you know one of a hundred different things but total failure. And we, after a couple months, ultimately killed it. Um, but, you know, that was something that we were able to measure, right? We, we're not just going to say, oh, there's one person griping. It's nobody is actually using this. <laughs> <laughs> the people that are using it are using it incorrectly. Um, it, is, it is a failed product. <laughs> All right, we'll try again with something else. <laughs> And uh, what is your best guess for if you had to, you know, pick why that didn't work? What, why do you think? I think because it was another platform. I think people already had their platforms of choice for chat. I think whether it was Skype or AIM or, or Facebook um, and just creating another one, I, I think – Mm-hmm. probably uh, just it, it, it creates confusion, right? It's just another thing you got to do another place you got to go. Mm-hmm. Um, look, I, I still stand by the product. I think it was a good decision to make that product. I, I think there's a ton of value in it. I used it when it was around. I found it very, very helpful as like, not just as Josh CEO, but as like user to user, I thought it was fantastic. Um, but you know, you live, you learn. Yep. As Josh CEO, what are your main responsibilities that you focus on now? Me? Uh, today, my main responsibilities are ensuring that my, my team leads all are on the same page, ensuring that we know where we're going, we know what we're working on, um, uh, making sure that the company, the people side of things is working really well um uh staying on top of our culture making sure that people feel good people feel valued um people have clarity in who we are and what we're doing um i am definitively still the um you know chief uh advocate 
of bigger pockets, you know, the face, the, the, the brains, the beauty. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm the guy that, you know, I, I talk to the other, I talk to other companies. I'm not the only one, but you know, I, 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 I'm out there advocating on our behalf. I'm, I'm the one out there trying to create relationships. I'm the one, you know, I, I look at all the options too, right? I mean, I, as the owner of a company, you need to know, you need to know other businesses in your industry. You need to think about things like, hey, do we raise money? Do we not raise money? You know, if we're, go if we're gonna have an exit, how do we do that? Um, how does all that work? Because, um, you know, as, as the owner and CEO, I'm both. There's actually two roles there, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they conflict, um, but I have the responsibility of, of knowing and understanding all these different things and, and factors that are kind of out there um, and sometimes I have to fight myself on, Hey, what's best for the company? Is it the same as what's best for Josh owner of the company? Um, how does that work out? Thinking all that stuff through is, uh, it's complicated. It's complicated, but yeah, that's, I think that's probably the gist of what I do. And then working again, working, I love getting my hands dirty on product. I love kind of, um, working with our design guys and, and guiding, my vision through them. Um, I like working th with our marketing people. Um, and, and, um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably a you, good description. You, you, you mentioned the question of, do we raise money? Do we not raise money? Have you raised money for bigger pockets? Never. Nope. And why is, is that? So when, when I started the company, it was a hobby site, right? I was just doing it for fun and well, um, I don't know how much fun I was having, but I was, <laughs> it was a hobby site still eventually became this lifestyle business. And, and, um, you know, in, in the first number of years, I, I did think a lot about raising, not raising. It was the cool thing to do. Hey, I got a tech company. I should raise money. Um, and then I have this valuation and now I'm worth all this money, you know, all that stuff that, that the tech press and everybody else kind of perpetrates. And, um, I've definitively uh, perseverated, but at the end of the day, I've always decided not to raise because um, I never wanted to have somebody over my shoulder telling me, hey, this is how this company needs to be run. Um, hey, Josh, you need to, you better get an ROI in the next three years or you're going to be out of job and we're going to shut your company down. Like for me, that would be a travesty. This company is too important, not just to me, but to so many people that, um, you know, I can't possibly have somebody who doesn't get it um, directing what we do and how we do it in order to just eke out some kind of return. So um, that's been it. But look, I mean, there's, there's use in raising money. There's value in raising money based on strategic objectives. You know, do we want to go and acquire a company? Um, it might be helpful. Hey, do we want to, you know, do we need to, you know, drastically improve our headcount in order to create or modify some kind of product? You know, that, that might be a reasonable use, but there's other ways to do it too, right? There's loans and, and things like that. Um, but right now we're, we're good and, and um, I'm not necessarily looking though, you know, if somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm going to give you some FU money uh, to buy a piece of your company, I might have to have a conversation with them for sure, but you know, um, I'm not necessarily seeking out uh, a capital raise right now for any particular um, product or objective. You mentioned some of the aspects of your responsibilities that you focus on that you really love, like the product, working with the marketing people, et cetera. What's the least favorite part of what you're responsible for? talking to you. I mean, uh, this show is great. Um, uh, what is it? What is the, you know, look, I mean, we've got 20 something people at, in our office, you know, from when, once you start getting, you know, more than a handful of people, pe personalities come in and, and, you know, people drama kind of yep. happens. It's, it's inevitable no matter how good, yep you are at hiring no matter how hard you try no matter how many ping pong tables you have oh yeah yeah and we got two i know i know uh, but but um yeah that that really is the one thing that 
drives me nuts. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of of the old school, like, can't we all get along kind of, you know, I'm, I may not think you're a particularly good person, but you know, I work with you. Well, <laughs> I, frankly, that shouldn't be the case. That, that's not, that's not your opening line when you resolve, attempt correct. to resolve an issue. Correct. Correct. No, oh, that's not me you're resolving. Not a particular, me. You're not a particularly good person, but no, hey, I'll work with you on this. That let's is resolve. me acting as somebody who may have a squabble with somebody else. <laughs> that is not me as me. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I just, look, when, when I, I'm from New York, when I don't like somebody, I tell them like, hey man, you know, this, this isn't working. I don't like you. I don't have that at the company and I don't see that at the company because like I would hang out with everybody at the company if I weren't their boss. Like everybody here I like and, and um, they're all good people. And, uh, but you know, look again, that that's irrelevant. You know, you may have different mindsets, different mentality, and you may not get along super well with somebody, um, but be, be a pro, you know, mm-hmm. work, work through it and figure it out. And most, most of the time that happens here, 90, 99% of the time that happens here. But, you know, when, you know, when the drama comes up, it just, it obviously, which is inevitable. It, it, I hate dealing with it. I hate dealing with it. How do you, you know, your first hire, Brandon, did well there, clearly. Uh, how, how do you, yeah, well, <laughs> I know that that's a subjective comment, but uh, he did outstanding. <laughs> how do you um, help? set your team up for success on subsequent hires? It's a good, good question again. Wow. Look at you. Um, I would say having a very clear idea of the kind of culture we're trying to create, um, having a very clear idea on job objectives and roles and responsibilities um, and making sure that, we have team buy-in. Um, so one of the things that we do is we have, uh, call it a quote, family interview, um, where a potential hire, you know, they're going to go through all the regular rigmarole, um, you know, make sure that they're, they're skilled and capable and they can do the job. But, you know, are they somebody that the team as a whole can get along with? Are they somebody that share kind of the mindset that, that the family does? Um, and, and so, you know, if you're an engineer, you're going to be sitting down with a customer service person, a, a, a designer, a support, you know, you know, folks from all different areas of the company who may not directly even work with you. But the idea is that by doing that, we can get, um, you know, clear objectives we can get clarity on who this person is and um frankly we also have a no a-hole rule so you know it also really helps to vet out the a-holes that may be coming through because you know four of us may not see it but the fifth person may be like you didn't see that 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 lady was a total a-hole or that guy was a total a-hole what um can you clarify that yeah blah 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 Oh yeah. Okay. You're right. Woo. Good catch. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Are there, is there any um, direction given to the family interview for the people who are doing the interviewing? Oh yeah. There's, I mean, our, our HR make sure that they're asking legal questions and, and doing it all in the way that they're, they're able to. So yes. Got it. Uh, All right. Fair enough. Um, We're not, we're not asking, well, I, hey, so how many kids do you have? I, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't implying that. I, I was, it was more along the lines of. Hey, Joe, awful. are you, are you Christian? Because we don't <laughs> hire Christians here. Um, if there, if there, everybody. yeah, of course you do. <laughs> if, if there was a particular, um, I guess, format or if it was just a round table and then it's just, okay, here's all these people and they just start asking you questions. It's, it's, you know, I think it's fairly loose. Okay. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's talk about what, kind of talk about what we were touching on earlier. And that is in bigger pockets as a business. What are your top three revenue streams? Sure. So uh, our top streams are advertising, memberships, and our publishing business. 
Okay, got it. And what do you see the most potential for in the future of those three? Uh, actually, the the most potential is is not one that has been named. Um, I I think providing connecting our users with um, service providers um, through like lead gen is is definitively one of the biggest opportunities for us there's just there's so many people uh that are looking for x on the platform and x is usually like hey i need a great agent i need a great lender i need a you know i need a property manager i need all these things and um i i think servicing that is going to create a monster opportunity for us from a financial standpoint. And I think it's also going to create a massive opportunity for our users to, to get their needs serviced, you know, help, help people find what they want, find what they're looking for and, and solving that. So that's, I think one of the, the big opportunities, uh, biggest opportunities for us going forward. I mean, the ad business, look, as the site grows, as you know, as all of our different media grow, um, you have the opportunity to grow that, but over time, I mean, when I started the company almost 13 years ago, our, our, uh, revenue per thousand eyeballs, um, was five, six, seven times what it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, that's kind of where things have gone in online advertising, which is great. No problem. You know, which is why we also have created other means for, driving revenue. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have been out of business a long time ago. Mm -hmm. In terms of your focus as a CEO in bigger pockets, what's something that keeps you up at night? Either it excites you or it is something that, you know, is, is a concern of yours. What keeps me up at night? I would say the things that I really ponder are how do we, how do we touch more people? Um, how do we, how do we tell folks who don't already know about us or, and you know, not even us, how do, how do we help the millions of people or tens of millions of people out there that don't even realize that they have an opportunity to go forth and build wealth through something other than their nine to five. Um, be, because, you know, we do a really crappy job in this country in teaching people financial wellness. We don't teach them financial wellness. You know, you don't learn that stuff in school. You don't learn, uh, maybe few and far between you do, but, um, we, we don't teach that. And, and so the average, the average person might learn about banking. Maybe they'll learn about a savings account. Some of them don't trust it and put their money under their pillow anyway. Um, so folks who have jobs that give them 401ks may know that they have a 401k and know that their company contributes to it and that they should put their money in the market. But, you know, they may not know what that really means. They may not understand like, okay, what does buying a stock actually mean? What is buying a mutual fund actually mean? What is an ETF? Um, uh, and then all the way down to real estate, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of people, most people look at real estate and they say, well, that's for rich people. You know, only rich people could buy real estate. Only, only really wealthy people have an opportunity to do that. Um, and we say that's not true. And, mm -hmm. and we say, well, how do we, how do we solve this? Because I do think it's a, I think it's a real problem in our society um, I just talked to so many people who are like, you know, I don't, I don't have a chance. I don't have an opportunity. I can't get out of whatever it is that I'm in, you know, my life, my lifestyle, um, my, my place in society, I'm stuck. And, you know, unfortunately, the second you have that mindset, you're stuck, you're done. Mm -hmm. You're not getting out. Um, so how do we change it? How do we alter that? Um, and you know, how can I, through bigger pockets, touch as many people as possible and pass the message that, you know, it may not be real estate. Look, I mean, if, if, if we can use our voice in some way, shape or form to help somebody who thinks they're stuck, get unstuck, um, and they never go into real estate, then we, we succeeded. 
you know, mm-hmm. if, if it's, Hey, I want to, you know, I'm unhappy with my job and bigger pockets help me realize I'm unhappy with my job. So I'm going to go find another one that just best suits who I am and what my truth is. Then I just did my job and, and we're, we're solving, um, a need. Um, so yeah, that's the stuff that, that I'm always just trying to crunch through is how do, how do we do that? How do we impact it? And again, I, I think that problem is a lot bigger than bigger pockets. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think we're here to help solve it, but we can't solve it alone. I, I think, you know, there's, there's societal things that we need to do. We need our, our, our schools need to, to make change. Our government needs to, yeah, as, as much as I'd hate to say our government needs to get involved, but I, I think they should play a role. I, I think, you know, teaching wellness, uh, financial wellness and teaching people to not rely on the system and um, is uh, only creates a, a more productive society. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of ties into what you were talking about just a second ago the connecting users to service providers via lead generation, perhaps maybe not a service provider, but just connecting people from, they have a challenge to here's your solution. Um, Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, the, the big issue I always have is there's never one solution. Um, And, and I, I think one of the reasons bigger pockets is successful is because we we were never so bold as to say that we know there's one answer for everybody you know this is what's right for everybody um you know a very anti-guru mentality that we have um instead it's hey you joe come on bigger pockets and you have a question or an issue or concern and you get 10 people 15 people 20 people with 10 15 20 different ideas on what works and then you have an opportunity to go through and say oh you know what works best for me Mm -hmm. um I, I think that's why organizations like EO, which I'm not a part of, but I, I contemplate joining all the time, or YPO are so successful. You know, they don't, they're organizations where people aren't telling you what to do. Um, well, people do tell you what to do on bigger pockets. You just don't have to listen to them. <laughs> but it's, hey, I'm going to share my story. And through my story, you can kind of extract an answer or maybe after hearing two or three stories you can extract what's true for you um i i think the beauty of bigger pockets is you get altering opinions and those opinions are there for you to, to kind of guide you whether it's a, something you read on a post on bigger pockets or whether it's just something you've come across as an entrepreneur what's the worst advice that you've seen or have been given personally uh the worst advice um trust me <laughs> <laughs> I, I i you know i i think the most dangerous or worst thing that i see is typically and i i really don't see it i just i don't think i see this i just know that people do it mm-hmm. um people not taking responsibility for their own doing their own homework, doing their own due diligence. You know, whether that, that could be in anything, whether it's, hey, I'm going to go buy a property from a turnkey company and I'm going to trust their numbers or I'm going to buy a property, a rental property from an agent and I'm going to trust the numbers from the seller um, or, hey, I'm you know, going to partner with somebody, but I'm not going to do background checks and I'm not going to make sure that they are who they say they are. Um, I, I, I think that's the one thing that I see over and over again, which just, I, it blows my mind. Like I, as much, even on bigger pockets, I mean, there's people on bigger pockets here on the site that, that have been around for years and years and thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of posts mm-hmm. and they're wicked smart. And, and I want to trust the hell out of them. But if I were going to get into bed with them, if I were going part to partner with them, I'm going to go through every ounce of due diligence check that I would with anybody else that I didn't know at all. Um, and I think that's, that's the one thing that, that I, that people do that drives me, drives me nuts. Do your homework, do your due diligence. Um, and, and, you know, look at the end of the day, there's shitty people out there. Sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on your show, but there's, bleep me. There's, there's people out there that take advantage of people 
in society in the world and and uh, you know unfortunately everywhere else and 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 so um it is incumbent upon us, us to make sure we are protecting ourselves and our families and our nest eggs by uh being careful and mm-hmm. and so i think that's not necessarily something that i see but something that um I know happens all the time um, on or off the site. And I, I think it's just so important that people, um, you know, do their homework. On the due diligence note and you know, doing your homework, a question that Dave M asked is what are the likes and dislikes between, and this is for you, obviously specifically for owning a business versus owning real estate and which one do you enjoy most? Uh, I, I think the dislikes are the same on both. I think the likes are, the dislikes are the people, not not that I dislike my people, (laughs) but I dislike the people, people drama. Like I, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, I'm a relatively low drama kind of guy. Like just, you know, so, so people drama. I, I just don't like it. Um, likes, I would say they're very similar, right? I mean, you're, you're kind of embarking on some endeavor to, to, to reach some kind of goal, right? And, and real estate, it's, Hey, I want to buy some property with the means to build wealth, um, in some way, shape or form, um, in business. It's, it's the same, you know, how do I do it better? Well, at least for me, I always have the, how do I do better? How can I, how can I do a better job than I did before? How can I not make this mistake again? How can I improve my processes? How can I um, serve more people in a better way? How can I, you know, if it's rental property, how do I treat my, my, my tenants better, whatever it is. So I don't know, for me, the likes are in the, the challenge of, doing better. Mm -hmm. Um, and the dislikes are in the challenge of people who Mm -hmm. are difficult or could be (laughs) difficult from time to time. I have identified your own personal version of hell. Are you ready for it? Uh, uh, yeah, no, you're going to give me an anxiety (laughs) attack. It is. If you were trapped in a room with a big screen TV playing Jerry Springer on loop, yeah, that sounds pretty terrible. <laughs> People are griping and griping and griping. Yeah, right. Yeah, it would pretty much be my version of hell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. You have you and Brandon interview a bunch of people and high achieving real estate entrepreneurs as well as people who are just getting started. So you 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 benefit from getting a yeah a front seat and hearing about how people are achieving certain things and what works, what doesn't work. Where do you see the future of real estate investing industry going or just real estate in general going? Is there anything that you see in the future that is, is coming, coming to light? Um, you know, there's so many new companies trying new stuff, right? Um, uh, man, I think it would be it would it'd be nice for some of the process to be simplified. Um, I think it would be um, it would be I don't know. Let me th- let me think about this for a second here. So, at the end of the day, people. Well, there's two two groups of people, right? There's there's homeowners, and then there's investors. And and I think you have to group them separately because their mindset is typically very different. Um, new investors, I think, are going to think like a homeowner. Experienced investors are going to think like a business owner. Um, uh, from from the homeowner perspective, look, you, you're you going to buy a house. You're going to want to walk that house. You're going to want to walk through it. You're going to want to feel it. You're going to want to experience it and, and uh, get a vibe for it. You know, there's all these prognostications and development of technology for, you know, Hey, you know, let me put on some VR goggles and walk around a property. I don't know. I've never worn VR goggles. So I, I cannot even imagine how that would be. Well, I can't imagine, but I just don't know what it's like. 
but I can't imagine it, it giving you the same experience as walking through the property that you're going to buy. You know, there's a smell, right? There's a there vibe. There's a smell. There's an energy. There's a feeling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, inside and outside that you'll never in a million years get from VR, right? I think people buying houses, no matter what, are going to have to always go, at least the vast majority, that's the, the vibe that they want. They want to feel it. So I don't know that there's any way to bypass that. Now, um, for that group, hey, can we make financing easier? Can we make, you know, the paperwork easier? Hey, can we, can we make the, the process easier? Yes. <laughs> that's a definite yes. Um, you know, do I, why do I have to sign 8,000 sheets of paper? Or, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know there's, there's ways that, that can all go. Uh, from the investor perspective, you know, I, I think just facilitating information flow. And I, I think the same goes for the regular homeowners as well. Um, there's still just so much bad information out there. We rely on, you know, a, a seller's agent to provide accurate information, which they may not be privy to, or, or um, they may not um, necessarily want to have full disclosure of, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, how, you know, how can we centralize this stuff? How can we, I, I know very little about blockchain, but I think blockchain um, can be a, a very, very good technology for the use for, for real estate information because, you know, what's in, what, once that accurate data is in the chain, you know, if somebody messes with it, everybody knows, right? So, um, create, you know, f- finding a way to, to ensure that accuracy and truthfulness is passed along. Look, I bought a house a couple of years ago, my primary, and there had been water damage in the living room and they had repaired that water damage. That was not disclosed at the sale. Um, it was not disclosed at the sale and the, the cause of the water damage was actually never fixed, right? <laughs> so there was water damage on the floor. The floor was fixed. The cause was not repaired. <laughs> I bought it. I didn't notice it. And two, three months later, my floor started warping and coming apart because the, uh, I, I don't, you know, clearly the homeowner knew. Um, there is a high likelihood that the agent knew, but at the end of the day, nobody, nobody disclosed it. So I end up with all this damage. That's, I mean, it's a lot of money. This is on the order of probably 10 K plus. Um, and that never in a million years should have happened. Um, that the second I went and fixed that person went and fixed the floor that should have been disclosed or added to some, some kind of thing that would be pa- like a Carfax, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. something that would pass along. So I know what the deal is. Hey, these homeowners did X, Y, and Z. These homeowners, you know, did all these modifications and changes and it's, it's part of the permanent record. So I think stuff like that would be really, really valuable and really, really helpful. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're still, there's always going to be a demand for real estate. There's always going to be a demand and a need for people to own property. Um, you know, Hey, crowdfunding came along and suddenly like crowdfunding is going to dominate and take over everything in real estate. Eh, you know, it, it, it's another way to, to, to raise money. It's another way to finance a property. It's another way for people with money to get a return, but people are still buying and selling and getting loans. I mean, the basics are always going to be the same. I can't, I can't imagine the basics ever changing. I just think we'll come up with creative ways for, for um, making different parts of the process easier and, and better and more accurate. Another question from uh, his name's Josh as well. Do you agree Let's, by the way? I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that um, when you talk to institutional guys and gals who have a more macro level than I do and to look at it from a much more well, institutionalized um, reference point, real estate investing, they say that real estate investing is broken. It's a fractured industry and there's not a lot that connects the dots among all the properties, uh, unlike other industries that they invest in. 
Sure. And I think that what you're talking about, the Carfax for a, a properties, that is a some sort of national or statewide database is is needed and would certainly be helpful. And I, 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 I do see that coming. Uh, it's just inevitable with the amount of technology that and smart people that are in the world. Um, and so, yes, I do agree. Cool. Uh, so Josh uh, asks, what are the three to five most important things in your experience to growing and scaling a company? The most important things to growing and scaling a company. Uh, one, having a good idea that's scalable. <laughs> uh, start there. Um, and, you know, uh, let's see. To, so having an idea, having some kind of plan, whether or not it's written, I don't think you need a necessarily a written plan from zero. I think you need to, um, I didn't. Um, uh, but so to an idea, uh, well, one an idea to a plan. Um, three, you've got to have, your business has to solve some kind of need for the customer that somebody else is not serving. Um, or that somebody, you know, I, I say that out loud and I hear, I think about like McDonald's versus Burger King. Burger King is solving a need. McDonald's is solving the same need, but you know, it, now it's flavor choices, right? Like, mm -hmm. do you like A or B better? Um, but having, having a USP, a unique selling proposition, something that is unique or that you believe to be unique about what it is that you're, uh, you're doing, you're building, you're offering service, product, you name it. Um, three, being passionate or having a team of people that are absolutely passionate about that idea. Um, it, it's, it's pretty rare to see successful companies where companies get to a point of success where the founders or creators or people running the show um, did not have some kind of passion for it. It's just, it's too hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's too, it, it's too much work. It's too difficult um, to, to, to struggle through that without having that passion. Um, uh, having a dedication to people and to your own people. Um, so uh, you can't build a company. You can't build a, a scaling company without um, taking care of people. And I'm saying that, and then I could think of examples of companies where, <laughs> they have a really crappy culture and I'm like, oh, maybe not. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think what comes around, uh, mm -hmm. goes around. Um, I think those are the keys. And, and especially in 17, 2017, when we're recording this, I, I think um, something that we didn't do in the past, and by we, I mean businesses in general, um, becoming very data oriented, metrics and data and understanding your business from a data perspective. Um, I think you often see small businesses where they don't get it um, struggling a lot. Um, and, and so um, knowing your numbers, if you're, you know, if let, let's take real estate investors, if you're a real estate investor and you, you do mailings, right? You, you market by mail. If you don't know your send and open rates and your cost per send and um, your funnels, then you're, you're just throwing money out the window. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're doing. You have no way to measure whether or not what you're doing is successful or not. And, and so, you know, pizza restaurant, right? What's our, what's our cost per ingredient? And can we drop that down and, and measuring our volume per day and, and being able to predict, you know, most restaurants fail because of they, they can't buy correctly. Right. And they can't manage their costs and all the waste. And, and so that all of that, is knowing and understanding the numbers. So um, I think that's probably one of the biggest things 